In the last episode, Alexandria's safe zone had a lot of problems, before they could catch their breath. Another group of uninvited guests arrived at the door, the atmosphere tensed, and everyone, armed and ready, prepared for a potential conflict. These men were dressed in white armor, and they were armed with fine firearms. Just when they thought there was going to be a confrontation, a familiar figure stepped out to intervene. We're all friends. They're here to help. It was Eugene, who had been away for a long time. Rewind to a month ago when Eugene first connected with a woman named Stephanie through a radio communication, they engaged in delightful conversations and even arranged a meeting point for their online romance to materialize, with the whisperers devastating the hilltop. Ezekiel and Yumiko accompanied Eugene to the rendezvous point, driven by both Eugene's quest for love and the desire to forge new alliances against the whisperers. Upon arriving at the designated location, instead of Stephanie, they were greeted by a group donned in white armor, subsequently blindfolded and escorted to a heavily guarded camp. The severity of the situation became evident. Eugene speculated that these individuals might be Stephanie's associates, but their intentions remained unclear. Soon, Eugene found himself in a small room, and upon having the blindfold removed, he was astonished. Before him were people dressed in immaculate suits, appearing utterly out of place in a post-apocalyptic world. Standing beside them was a man in orange hued armor, presumably the commander of the soldiers, exuding an aura not to be trifled with. The woman calmly explained that they were federal inspectors, here for a level 1 assessment, passing the evaluation would grant them entry to level 2, while failure would result in further measures, the nature of which Eugene couldn't fathom, the interrogation began, and to their surprise, the questions were surprisingly basic, almost absurd, queries about parents' occupations, university details, and post-graduation work placements were straightforward and willingly answered, however, when asked why they had gone to the train station, Yumiko and the others fabricated a tale of a leisure trip, only Eugene told the truth about his appointment with Stephanie and his desire to meet her, but he didn't mention Alexandria's safe zone, as time ticked away, the questions became increasingly bizarre, delving into the frequency of bowel movements and the choice of toilet paper, the relentless interrogation persisted for a grueling seven hours, with Ezekiel finally reaching his breaking point. He turned to the man in orange armor, venting his frustration. You must be in charge here, subjecting us to this pointless repetition. What's the meaning behind keeping us here and bombarding us with irrelevant questions? Your flashy orange armor suggests you're just a power-hungry jerk. The man didn't take offense as if he wasn't being scolded. Ezekiel, already battling respiratory cancer, was now overcome with agitation, leading to violent fits of coughing. Surprisingly, the man offered him a cup of water displaying an unexpected touch of consideration. After the exhaustive questioning, they sat together for a meal, discreetly exchanging information. Princess suggested finding a way to escape, expressing suspicions about the abnormality of these people. Ezekiel and Yumiko agreed, feeling that the so-called federal community might be a ruse. In unanimous accord, they decided to escape this eerie place. Eugene, however, urged caution, highlighting the politeness of their captors and the provision of food. Stephanie had warned me that her companions were very careful, that we should cooperate with them in their trials and even confess where we came from. This suggestion met immediate opposition from Ezekiel. Fearing that these armed individuals might raid Alexandria's safe zone, Eugene quickly apologized, acknowledging his oversight, but insisted that these people could potentially aid against the whispers. Just then, two soldiers burst in, grabbing one of the diners forcefully. Despite resistance, the person was taken away. Witnessing this, Eugene's breathing quickened. The prospect of further measures seemed ominously cruel. What was once a desire to negotiate now transformed into a desperate urge to escape this sinister place. But how to get out is a problem. While they were thinking, Princess had a plan because she was very good at observation. Even though the soldiers were all dressed alike, Princess could tell them apart by a few features. Two of them were lovers who disappeared for an hour every night during their shift. So, when night fell, Eugene and Yumiko quietly appropriated uniforms, posing as soldiers escorting Ezekiel and Princess outside. Navigating through the corridors and interrogation rooms, they glimpsed the individual undergoing further measures, trembling and occasionally erupting into desperate screams. Witnessing such distress only fueled their determination to swiftly leave. But at this time, the woman just looked at them suspiciously, but she didn't suspect anything. Crossing the corridor, they reached the outdoors, where a conspicuous yellow box caught their attention, labeled confiscated items for incineration. Inside lay stacks of marked dollar bills. 
prompting Princess's confusion why destroy currency in a post-apocalyptic world where money held no value? Continuing forward, they passed a wall adorned with photographs. Presumably, it served as a display of missing loved ones, aiding soldiers in expediting interrogations. Staring at the wall, they found themselves inexplicably inclined to believe in the existence of the federal community. Eugene urged them to move on, emphasizing the urgency of escaping. Hearing the shouts Yumiko and Ezekiel didn't dawdle, only Princess was still staring at the wall as she saw a familiar face. Yumiko wondered why her picture was here. She walked in and took off her helmet and looked at it. Sure enough it was really her and there was a note attached that said have you met my sister Yumiko please contact Yumiko. Please contact Tommy. Overwhelmed with disbelief and choked with emotion, Yumiko realized it was a message from her brother. In the end, they all return their clothes quietly instead of fleeing because there's no way they're going to leave their companion here alone. Yumiko, emotionally charged by the discovery on the photo wall, now believed in the authenticity of the federal community, especially with her brother apparently inside. So Yumiko was ready to talk openly with the leader of the place. While they're talking, Eugene rushes over and says that Ezekiel has disappeared. It hadn't been Ezekiel's turn to be questioned in order, but now he was nowhere to be found. Eugene speculated that Ezekiel's verbal confrontation with the leader the previous day might have led to retaliatory actions. Eugene, inherently timid despite his recent years facing zombies, couldn't hide his fear of death, his voice now tinged with a hint of tears. In contrast, Yumiko, more composed, sternly reminded Eugene not to disclose their origin, emphasizing the importance of secrecy. Yumiko, resolute, approached the nearest soldier. The soldier did not refuse Yumiko's request and took her again to the examination room, where the two auditors were still sitting opposite her. The woman calmly inquired, You've already undergone questioning. I don't understand why you want to see us again. Yumiko smirked. You think you're the one interrogating us. But it's actually the opposite. I've been scrutinizing you. They were a bit surprised to hear someone say that for the first time but then they gave a mocking look. Unexpectedly. Yumiko continued. I speculate that your community is extensive, well organized, with a bureaucratic system. You're part of it. The lady here likely was a forensic psychologist before the apocalypse. And you, sir, might be an academic researcher. Your job is to assess the threat to your community from outsiders. In order to determine our threat level and identity, you ask questions about pre-apocalyptic events. You even ask us how many times a day we go to the bathroom and what we wipe our arse with. It's a way to test our sense of boundaries. My friend Princess has a $2 note in her hand and you reprimand her. It makes me wonder if the currency in your community is still the US dollar and the amount of money in circulation is strictly controlled. And of course, your community leader is a great man. He uses the dollar as currency because he understands that people miss the old world. You want to know who we are, whether we're a benefit to your community or just a drain on your resources. But the truth is, you also need to justify your existence to us. I used to be a lawyer, and naturally I like the idea of a world with rules, and I agree with your approach. So maybe you need me, my brother, a surgeon, is currently living in the Commonwealth and is looking for me. So I'd like to expedite the process of vetting the four of us under your law. Yumiko's pre-apocalyptic expertise left the individuals across from her momentarily stunned, as her speculations had hit the mark. Suddenly, the door swung open, and a man carrying a cup of coffee walked in. He had overheard the entire conversation. Yumiko couldn't hide a smirk, realizing she had achieved her goal. Meanwhile, outside the room, Eugene and Princess anxiously waited on a bench, clueless about the ongoing developments. Princess couldn't hold it in any longer because she wanted to go to the toilet. She didn't care about Eugene who was terrified. She went straight to the soldiers. To her surprise, they were amiable and even pointed her to the restroom in unexpected relief. As she entered, the soldiers exchanged glances, then looked towards Eugene, who sat at a distance. Suspicious of potential schemes, one soldier decided to follow Princess inside. Eugene, still apprehensive due to the sinister label he had attached to the organization, grew increasingly uneasy. Twenty minutes passed, and anxiety escalated as Yumiko and Princess failed to emerge. Eugene, fearing the worst, pondered whether it was his turn next. Unable to endure the uncertainty any longer, he decided to confront the soldiers. Nervously, he stood up and approached them, a sense of dread filling his mind. No one's in there. No one is in there, sir. I need you to leave. Now. How could there be no one inside? He'd seen Yumiko go in there himself. 
and there were two censors, reluctant to provoke these seemingly unpredictable individuals. He turned away without entering. Eugene, restless during the late hours, couldn't shake the premonition that he might be the next to vanish. In anticipation, he fashioned a makeshift weapon from a piece of wood. The gate rattled, and Eugene quickly concealed his makeshift weapon as two soldiers arrived. Once again, he found himself in the interrogation room, facing the mail recorder, Evans. This time, Commander Michael took charge of the questioning. What have you done with my traveling companions? They're being processed. Eugene trembled even more at the answer. The word dispose in the administrative sense meant to destroy by secret means. Eugene couldn't help but envision Ezekiel and the others being processed into some sinister fate. Michael was very serious. He could see Eugene's nervousness and asked Evans, who was next to him, to pass him a piece of paper. Eugene took it with a shaky hand and wiped the sweat from his face. Eugene was overwhelmed with fear. The man across from him exuded an aura of someone not easy to get along with. Gathering his courage. He adjusted his emotions and began to speak. I have indeed been withholding some information. Initially, I wanted to be honest with you all, but I feared the judgment from my companions. In this past year of countless uncertainties and dangers, traveling with them, I stumbled upon a radio. Every day, I spoke into it, contemplating the slim chance that someone might hear. One day, to my surprise, a response came a captivating voice. I talked to her and even fantasized about living with her. The introvert in me imagined it all happening. Then I lied to Stephanie and told her I was from a large neighborhood that was experiencing an unprecedented crisis. Stephanie, out of pity, told me to meet her at the train station. I cajoled my only three companions that there were people here at the station who could help us. Stephanie was the only thing on my mind. I was completely in love with her. That's what I was hiding. I shouldn't have lied to Stephanie and I shouldn't have lied to my three friends. Eugene was getting more and more emotional as he spoke. As if all this was really happening, the two men on the other side of the table listened to Eugene's lovemaking, which was boring, but they didn't suspect anything. Following the interrogation, Eugene was relocated with a hood still covering his head. When he got off the train, he was taken to a section of the car. He was a bit nervous, but there were other people here, and one of the soldiers came to help Eugene to untie himself. Eugene cried tears of joy that they were still alive and that it wasn't as bad as he thought. Ezekiel explained that the commander, having detected his illness, took him to the medical room for nebulization and medication. Their bed was so comfortable that I fell asleep. Subsequently, Yumiko visited him, and together they discovered Princess in another detention room. As the door opened again, the imposing figure of Michael strode in. He took the documents handed to him by his assistant then faced them and read them out, indicating that they had completed the initial review and citizenship application assessment. Afterward, Michael informed them that soldiers would guide them to familiarize themselves with the community. Michael may look serious, but he's cute. The group could hardly believe they had been accepted into the Commonwealth. As Michael knocked on the door, soldiers ushered them out. This time, a girl in a floral dress entered beautiful and captivating. Eugene couldn't help but smile. It seemed like his spring had finally arrived. Um, which one of you is Eugene? I'm Stephanie. Hi. 